everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Ali Zaidi. Uh, Dr. Zaidi is an adult congenital heart disease specialist who received his MD from the Aga Khan University in Pakistan. He completed his uh, combined residency in internal medicine and pediatrics at the Penn State University. Uh, he then completed a combined fellowships in both pediatric and adult cardiology at the Nationwide Children's Hospital and the Ohio State University Medical Center. After completing his training, Dr. Zaidi was appointed as the Director of Research at the Columbus, Ohio Adult Congenital Heart Disease Program. In 2014, he moved to New York and was appointed as the Director of the Montefiore Adult Congenital Heart Disease and Pulmonary Hypertension Program at the Montefiore Einstein Center for Heart and Vascular Care as well as the Children's Hospital. Dr. Zaidi joined us at Mount Sinai as a full-time faculty in uh, January of 2019 in the role of Associate Professor of Medicine and Pediatrics. He's also the Director of the Adult Congenital Heart Disease Center, the Director of Pediatrics to Adult Transition of Care Program, and the Director of Academic Affairs in the Division of Pediatric Cardiology. So it's with that that we welcome Dr. Zaidi. Thank you very much for being with us this morning. Thanks, thanks Steve. Um, thanks, uh, Dr. Goldman, Dr. Kutzer, Dr. Sharma, for the opportunity. Um, I'm going to share my slides here, and hopefully you'll... Oops. Uh, we see him. You're okay. Yeah, we're okay. Can you see... Can you see the, I just want to make sure we're, you're seeing, you should be seeing the presenter, not the presenter, hang on, let me just move this back. You should be just seeing it now, are we good? Yes, that's the, uh, uh, that's not your view, it's our view, it's correct view. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Dr. Stern. So we'll, so thank you again for, for, um, for having me. So what I thought I'd um, talk about today and uh, um, is really neurocognition. And this is something that um, I got interested in um, a few years ago, um, and primarily because it got me thinking um, within the realm of adult congenital heart disease about the heart-brain connection. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll go through this as to what this means in the next, um, next 40 minutes. I'll walk through some of the definitions of what neurocognitive disorders are. I'll get into the domains of neurocognition. Um, there's a concept of executive functioning uh, that I'll try to explain what, what this means. And in fact, this is, I think, as I've, as I've learned about neurocognition over the last few years, I mean, this concept of executive functioning is, has actually taught me quite a bit and just sort of a normal day-to-day -day functioning, but this is a very important concept. And what, medi what mediators of executive functioning exist, and then this link between, between the heart and the brain. And I'll just focus within adult congenital heart disease and neurocognitive functioning, but this is really where the link between the heart and the brain comes in. These are my disclosures. I have no disclosures, but I have to say this. I've, I've, as I've gone through this process, I have to be upfront. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a neuropsychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, not a neurologist, not a neuroradiologist. I'm just an ACHD doc. And the reason I'm saying this is because this realm of neurocognition is really a realm that lives within, the, within um, uh, in essence, uh, neuropsychiatry, uh, neuropsychology, not even psychiatry, neuropsychology, or, uh, and that's, that's where this stems from. So, so let me start with the patient. I'll give you this, this sort of a scenario. And a lot of us um, in, in see this. This is a 23-year-old young man with detransposition, comes in for a routine visit. This is These are patients we see all the time in the 20s and 30s with congenital heart disease. Had an arterial switch operation at five days of age, so very early on, had no other interventions, has good function, no medications, has no past medical history, no family history, no drugs, no alcohol use, goes out, does face tennis, graduated from a local college, but says with significant effort. It took him a long time uh, to get through college. Uh, started grad school, um, moved to another state, and now comes in and says, I don't want to do this. He says, I can't do this. I, I, it's just too much for me to handle um, um, just getting through school and, and college. 
So just for everybody to know, I mean, again, I won't get into the granularity of, of, of the complexity of the underlying condition, but this is just to sh show you what transposition is. This is this is the right ventricle where the blue blood's coming in and the blue blood's going out into the aorta. And then the red blood or the oxygen blood comes into the left ventricle, goes out in the pulmonary arteries. The coronary arteries are here on the aorta, which is the coming out of the right ventricle. The reason I'm showing you this is because this patient underwent an arterial switch, which means the great vessel were transected where the circles are, and then the coronary buttons were moved over. And it, this, this particular patient only had one operation, but the point being that this was at five days of fail, you're on, you're, you're on cardiopulmonary bypass and circ arrest and things along those lines. But keep this in mind, and we'll come back to this, why this is important. And the question really comes out as to why is this patient struggling? Why is this patient struggling in school, in college? It hasn't, it hasn't had a lot of problems has had one open heart procedure, but really, but, but, the, but the patient's telling me, it's, yeah, I can't do this, I can't go to college, I can't go to school, why is this a problem? And that's where it got me thinking. So is the problem within the heart? Is the heart to be blamed for this? Or is it the brain? And this is where the heart-brain connection comes in. And I think this is where I will spend the next 30 minutes talking about the heart-brain connection. The one point I want to drive home as we talk about this is that when we think of the heart-brain connection in, in, in our world of cardiology, so if I wear my adult cardiology hat on for a second, we worry about strokes, hemorrhages. Uh, we think about paralysis and seizures. And that's really not the organic disease that we will be talking about. We will really be talking about um, the brain. So let me just talk you through, walk you through the brain. And I had to go back and go back to sort of med school and think about what the brain is. So let me, let me just show you this. And again, as I said, I'm not a neurologist, but this is the lobes of the brain. And when we get into neurocognitive functioning, we really start looking at the, what the different lobes of the brain mean. So if I go back to med school, we start at the back, the, the occipital lobe and the parietal lobe, it's vision and perception. There's a sensory cortex. There's a motor cortex, the temp temporal lobe. But this is really where the sphinx structure right in the front, the frontal lobe, which is where this, this concept of neurocognitive functioning arises. And I'll get into this. This is where executive functioning thinking, what we are doing as we, as we go through these grand rounds, thinking, planning, organization, problem solving, emotions, behavioral, that's where it comes from. And why is this a problem? And I'll show you this in, in just a second. So let me walk you through these three, three terms, cognition, neurocognition, and neurocognitive dysfunction. And as I've learned through this process, we often use these interchangeably. And really, they're not, they're all apples within the basket, so to speak, but each of this is a sort of a different apple. Let's talk about cognition. And really what cognition is, it is a mental action or process of acquiring knowledge and understanding through thought, experience, and the senses. And that's what cognition is. It's just the process of acquiring knowledge and understanding. That's what we're all doing, cognition. What this means is that the many aspects of cognition that we use on a daily basis, every single day, every hour, every minute, it's attention, it's the formation of knowledge, memory, working memory, which, I, which again is interesting. Memory is one thing, working memory is, a, is another. Judgment, how we evaluate a problem, how we reason, how we problem solve the decision-making process. All this is cognition. Each one of us, even as we go through, as I said, these grand rounds, we're going through a cognitive process. Neurocognition is that cognitive function is then linked to the function of the neural pathways. That's where the brain comes in. And that's within the cortical networks. And as I showed you, the, the the, the lobes of the brain, but maybe this is something that's at the cellular molecular level. That's a neurocognition. So now you're linking it to the neural pathways. But then what's neurocognitive dysfunction? And what that means is reduction or impairment of the cognitive function that I just described. So the process of acquiring memory, using memory. Uh, but what we're now seeing is that there is a phys physical change, an organic change that's happening in the brain that could happen either with an illness, could be psychiatric issue, could be a drug use or direct injury to the brain um, that can certainly happen in our world of, of cardiovascular medicine. So all those three terms are sort of linked. So the thought then comes, at, comes out is that, is this an abstract concept, neurocognition? It is just that, or is it concrete? Can we put, can we see it? Can we see it on an MRI? Can we see it on a CT scan? 
we in, as in cardiology like to see things. We need to see the angiogram or the echo, but is this an abstract or a concrete? And I think this is where that sort of realm comes in is that the, this is in essence um, a process of, of, of perception where you have all these different things that are happening in cognition. So there's attention, memory, fear, curiosity, hope, all these things are happening. So there, 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 is, there is a realm between concrete and abstract and I'll walk you through this. But as we get into neurocognition, these are in essence the domains. And this is data that's really coming from, this, from, from the world of neuropsychology. So if I break this down into neurocognitive domains, it is really these different domains. So if I start at the bottom here, it's complex attention. So how we give attention to something, when we are listening to something, how attentive are we? What is our speed of attention? Can we grasp it, process it? What is the social cognition, the thoughts in our head, the learning and memory, recall, recognition, the fluency of language, can we imbibe something and then syntax it? The perceptual motor functioning, that's where the, where, where the, the, the motor context um, uh, and the occipital lobe come in. But really this is where I'm going to focus on is executive functioning. And what this means is that you take all the neurocognitive domains that each one of us has and how can we process and plan decision make, working memory, how do we inhibit some of our memories and the flexibility that we show. And this is a concept of, of executive function. I'll walk you through this um, uh, in a second. And the concept here also is, again, data from neuro neuropsychology is that when we look at neurocognitive functioning, there is a hierarchy, which means even simple things like attention that, again, as we, are, as we are listening now, how we process it somewhere falls in the middle of this hierarchy. Memory goes a little bit higher, but really at the end of this is executive functioning, how we take everything and we process. And that's the concept of exec. So I go back to the heart-brain connection and I'm adding congenital heart disease here in a, at the top because I'll walk you through what this means. I'm gonna show you some data We I'm not going to focus on adult cardiovascular medicine, which is where there is some data for this. I will also not focus on pediatric cardiology, but I really focus on adult congenital heart disease and the concept of neurocognitive dysfunction as we go through the next few slides. This is data that came out from, from pediatric cardiology. So I'm gonna wear my pediatric cardiology hat here for a second. This is from the American Heart Association. And when you look at the data that's out there over the last 20 years, so from 2000 to 2021, last 20 years, there are about 400 PubMed publications on some concept of neurocognitive dysfunction in congenital heart disease. So the pediatric cardiology world has been talking about this for the last 20 years. And this is a sort of a landmark, sort of a HA scientific statement that came out. And this was uh, some a group of pediatric cardiologists through the American Academy of Pediatrics that said that we need to look at risk factors in children who are undergoing open heart procedures. We need to look at outcomes and we need to look for predictors of why these kids could develop neurocognitive dysfunction. I'll walk you through this in a second. What they also said was that when you look at all, um, all, all risk factors for congenital heart disease, so as these kids get into adult congenital heart disease, you look at risk factors for sudden death or exercise limitations or arrhythmias or repeat operations. When you look at all, all of the above, the thought is that neurocognitive dysfunction in the future, or as we are discussing today, is probably more prevalent than all the, the, the other factors that we look at. So we often talk about the risk of sudden death in tetralogy or transposition, but globally, when we look at neurocognitive dysfunction, the thought in the world of pediatric cardiology is that it's probably more prevalent than what we think. They again focus on executive functioning. I'll walk you through this in a second. And they've described many factors. I'll show you in a slide in a second, wh why these children are more prone to neurological or neuro neurocognitive dysfunction. Is it the congenital heart disease itself? Is it cyanosis? It is, is it the open heart procedure? Are they modifiable risk factors? When I look at adult cardiology, so now if I wear my adult cardiology hat and I look at the data out there, in the last 20 years, there have been about 300 publications on neurocognitive or cognition in adult cardiovascular disease. But a lot of this data is in essence coming from heart failure, 
from coronary artery disease, from post-cabbage operations, patients who've already had stroke and dementia. The one part of this that, that, that I probably won't get into uh, the granularity of this is dementia in, in adult patients who've had uh, cabbages or, or uh, advanced uh, heart failure. So the point being that neurocognition is being described in adult literature. Well, what about adult congenital heart disease? In the last 20 years, there are only 34 publications that are there for, for neurocognitive dysfunction um, in adult congenital heart disease. And we're seeing this more and more, but the data just isn't there. The 13 clinical studies, a lot of them are sort of uh, small case reports. There are eight clinical studies in a small cohort of patients. Really the top age is 30 years. So really in the, in the sort of the 18 to 20 year age group. Five clinical studies with more than 40 years of age. So again, young sort of middle-aged patients but really nothing in the older adult congenital heart disease population. So what does this mean? So what does this mean that neurocognitive dysfunction starts as a baby and it goes through adulthood to, to, to older age? So let me walk you through this. This is data that, that, that uh, came out about two years ago, in essence saying that when we think of congenital heart disease and neurocognitive dysfunction, the issues actually start in the fetus. So not just in the infant that's born, there's fetal cyanosis and hypoxia. There could be genetic syndromes. As these kids are born, they go through early cardiac surgery. They go to open heart procedures. They go through pump runs and circ arrest. They can have ICU stays. As they get older into their sort of eight to 10 year old, they can have frequent hospitalizations. This can lead to learning difficulties and they get into sort of young, young adulthood in their twenties and thirties. And now you're getting into the world of sort of adult congenital heart disease. And if I wear, again, my ACHD hat, now we're getting into heart failure and, and arrhythmias and maybe strokes. And then we don't quite know what this means as, as the brain ages in adult, adult congenital heart disease and what this means when these patients become uh, a little bit older. And, I, and I'll get to this in a second. So this in essence is the spectrum that neurodevelopmental changes are happening from the fetus all the way to adulthood. There is the concept of congenital heart disease, the actual disease itself, and everything that comes with it to now adding acquired cardiovascular disease. And then the cerebrovascular burden, the, ne the neurological part of this. So is there a third arm that we are not really paying attention to? And this data was published in CERC from Ariane Morelli, who's in Canada, who's done some fantastic work in neurocognition. And what she showed is that we really need to think about the fetus to the adult. And at each realm, from fetus to child to adult, there are different risk factors that can cause neurocognition problems. There is the, and I'll, I'll show you this again, I'm gonna bring it back to the brain, that the brain is actually seeing changes. So you're seeing the fetal brain seeing changes, you're seeing the child's brain seeing changes and the aging brain seeing changes. And each, at each realm, at each age group, there is a problem. And what this then leads to is what I initially talked about is impaired executive functioning, is visual spatial ability and neurocognitive dysfunction. So at every, every part of the human development, there is a cardiovascular problem and then there is a brain problem. So that's really the thought of it. This is data from the Medical College of Wisconsin uh, from Scott Cohen and Proven. They've actually very nicely elucidated in some of their studies that the risk factors in children are many, as I said. They've actually linked this to long ICU stays, cardiopulmonary runs, but in adults, if you look on the right side of this, now we're adding cardiopulmonary bypass runs, multiple operations, AFib, hypertension, stroke, diabetes, and they've said that in adult congenital heart disease, we've got to look at both spectrums, the childhood spectrum and then the adult spectrum. So what does this mean for us from executive functioning? So in the next 50, 10 or 15 minutes, let me just talk a little bit about this because this is something that we in cardiology don't really pay attention to the thought of executive functioning. So what does this mean? This, as I said, is the hierarchical top, top marker for neurocognitive functioning. This is the collection of control processes that we on instinct can rely on, which means how quickly can we take the information and make it worthwhile? Every day we do this, every single day. But what this means is a higher level of functioning. So what this also means is that we keep things organized on a daily basis. Some people do it very well and some people don't do it very well. So, but that's the concept of executive functioning. This has three cores. 
This has three cores, and let me just walk you through this. First is working memory, which means that on a, on a daily basis throughout our lives, we hold information in our brain. We can then spatialize it and say that without looking at it, how can we use our memory and plan for the future? So that's called working memory. So memory is one thing, but the other concept is you take the memory and you operationalize it. We make it a working memory. The second part is inhibitory control. control excuse me. What this means is we have our memory, we have our thought processes, we have our behaviors, each one of us. But then we have self-control. We can override our impulse and conditioned responses. We can control them. So we can control this and then make a decision as to what we think is appropriate. Each one of us do this. This is inhibitory control. And the last part of this is cognitive flexibility. And this is a very important concept is that now within that higher level of functioning, comes the, pers the perspective of change, which means how quickly can we change? Can we, can we adapt, inhibit, or activate thoughts? Can we reframe our ideas? And that is how we become successful. We, 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 we talk about cognitive flexibility. So the three cores of this. What this means is that with these three cores is executive functioning, which then means that if you look in the middle, we can reason, we can problem solve, and we can plan effectively. And what this means is we think multiple steps ahead. We are taking all our thought processes, we identify the risks, we inhibit our thoughts that we think will not work for us, and we think multiple steps ahead. And that's a higher level of functioning. But let's go back to the brain now. What this means is, again, the, 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 the sulcus of the, the, the prefrontal cortex. And if I take it to the prefrontal cortex, that's where the, this concept of neurocognitive functioning is arise. What this means is we decide what's good from bad. We decide what's an, a so, socially responsible um, act, a, a decision that we make. We decide if we want Coke from Pepsi or Pepsi from Coke uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and how we put our thoughts into action or in action, and that's the, the concept of this. So the prefrontal cortex is very, very important. And I'll walk you through this in a second too, is that there is some thought that the size of the brain and the size of the prefrontal cortex matters. And if there is a smaller size, and I'll, I'll show you some data for this, then that changes our experiences, it changes our development, it changes how we respond to stimuli and how we learn. And the fascinating part about this is that the prefrontal cortex or parts of the brain continue to develop till the age of 25. So now if you think about all our young patients with congenital heart disease or even in the uh, 20s, the brain of the prefrontal cortex is still developing. So what does this mean in adult congenital heart disease? And those of you who've seen adult congenital heart patients, we look at it as a multi-system issue, but we're adding neurocognitive functioning to this realm. So it is another layer to adult congenital heart disease. Now, this is a new paradigm that we are looking at ahead, and I'm going to walk you through some data. So let's talk about the data of neurocognitive functioning in adult congenital heart disease. But before I get into this, I want to drive one point home. This is neurocognitive testing and results. What this really, really means, it's a very important point, is that these tests are validated tests, which means they've gone through a series of and many, many tests for assessing neurocognitive function for all of us or for patients. The interpretation of this cognitive testing has to be done by neuropsychologists. This is not something that you or I can do because these are validated tests and each one of them is sort of broken down. So let me walk you through some data. So if you look at the top, this is 2005. As I said, the data only started coming out about 15 or 16 years ago. This is a small study. Look at the end, it's 54 patients. It's tetralogy of follow. They looked at neuropsychology um, uh, testing. And again, the different tests, I won't get into the granularity of why they chose this test. But the point I'm trying to make here in, in, congenital, in tetralogy of follow is what they found was that the quality of life was, was less than your, your controls. What they also found during these testing, and this, if you look at this as sort of a, one of the cognitive all, all, uh, testing um, uh, test results that they're showing, and if you look at it, they look at each thing, learning and memory and, and, and fluency, um, and things along those lines. But the, the driving point is that some patients did have deficits in memory, but the major deficit was in executive functioning. So what I just talked about, that higher level of functioning, it, the ability to problem solve and plan, these patients with tetralogy were unable to have that. So there was a problem with executive functioning. 
What they also showed, so this is another study in 2015, Tetralogy of Fallot, again, a small cohort, just 66 patients, they had 85 controls. Again, they looked through, they used a couple of different tests. And again, they, these are different tests. As I said, I won't get into the granularity. This is too, it's beyond the scope here is that these are tests that they use. These tests are then uh, composited by neuropsychologists. But what they showed again in this study was that patients with Tetralogy of Fallot had a deficit in attention, and executive functioning. So once again, they were showing that there was a problem here. They were unable to do that higher level of, of functioning on this testing. We're moving to 2016 here. Again, small study, 48 patients. They took many different congenital heart disease. They've had this data from Emory and they broke it down into cyanotic and acyanotic. And what they showed again was that ejection, for, sorry, uh, executive functioning was worse in patients um, overall across all realms of congenital heart disease. And what they also showed was that the worse the congenital heart disease, the worse the executive functioning. So the neurocognitive functioning was even worse. And this is just to show you how they broke it down. Is this single ventricle cyanotic, two ventricle cyanotic, cyanotic and two ventricle acyanotic. This single ventricle cyanotic are the most complex, the Fontans or cyanotic. And if you show, if you look here, this is, this is, they had the worst neurocognitive functioning when even when you compare it within other realms of congenital heart disease. So worse the congenital heart disease, these young patients do worse than neurocognitive functioning. So higher likelihood of disability, higher likelihood of unemployment as we go forward. Uh, this is 2016, just to show you again, a small study, 48 patients, all forms of congenital heart disease. They're looking at neurocognitive functioning by a battery of different tests. And what they're again showing here, if you look across this, is the different, different sort of um, domains of neurocognition. So memory and processing speed, executive functioning. And we look here, the black column is moderate congenital heart disease. The white column is severe. Across each one of them, there was they did worse. These patients did worse. It didn't matter um, which, which form of congenital heart disease these patients had. Um, they certainly showed worse neurocognitive functioning. What they also showed here was something which was very interesting is that the worse the congenital heart disease and the more operations these young patients had, so if you go from one operation, open heart to second, third, and fourth, the worse their executive functioning, which means that there is something to do with how often we're taking these kids when they're young through open heart procedures and pump runs or circ arrests. So more surgeries, worse neurocognitive functioning. Um, and this is from 2017, looking at uh, transposition and, and, and tetralogy. So they took two cohorts and they took a healthy age match controls. And once again, what they showed was, this is, these are the cases in black and the controls are in the, in, um, in the white column. And what they, they looked at IQ and this is very fascinating again, is when you look at lower IQ, when you look at lower ranges, so 79, 89, 99, the black is the patients with congenital heart disease. Lower IQ, congenital heart disease patients had lower IQ across the board. But when you got into higher IQ, the congenital heart disease patients did worse. So the controls had higher IQ. So across the board, lower IQ, congenital heart disease patients were worse. Higher IQ, they had lower, lower IQ when compared to control. So again, this is a spectrum that we were that they were seeing. This is from Columbia and Columbia over the last couple of years has come out with again, two small studies. Again, if you look at this 67 adult patients with transposition, average age of 22.9, 43 healthy controls. And what they showed again, lower IQ, cognitive problems. And let me just show you this. And what they showed was they, again, looked at IQ. If you look at the bottom right here, uh, verbal IQ and performance IQ. So they broke IQ down within different realms. And what they said was when you look at the controls and when you look at the, uh, the patients, these are transposition patients, at each sub-segment of IQ, be it full IQ, verbal or per per performance IQ, the, the congenital heart patients were doing worse and actually broke it down into severe cognitive impairment or mild cognitive impairment. But the point being that they were seeing this across transposition, uh, transposition patients. This, oh, I apologize, let me just go back here. This was a fascinating study from the United Kingdom, which I thought this was just about six months ago. And they looked at the biobank. They took a thousand ACHD patients, mostly with, uh, with mild to moderately complex, 900 patients. There were only about a hundred or less than a hundred complex patients. They looked at neurocognitive testing and across the board, 
they found that again, there was neurocognitive dysfunction and the different tests don't worry about all this. But what they showed was that across a thousand patients, there was reduced visual attention, cognitive flexibility, processing speed. So, so across a thousand, this was the largest study that we that's out there in the last 20 years, because all the other studies that I showed you in adult congenital heart disease are 60 patients or 35 patients or 40 patients. But this was this was this was the largest. So let's go back to the brain. So the next 10 minutes, let me just show you something. So does size matter? Does the brain matter? And this is important. So let me walk you back. I'm going to wear my pediatric cardiology hat on and take you to the fetus. This is a fascinating study in circulation about 10 years ago. And what they showed was that you look at the gestational age, this is a fetus. They looked at the brain size with ultrasounds and what they showed, the red, the red diamond is the control and the congenital heart disease is the circle, that as gestation went on, the size, the total, total brain volume started dropping off. So if you, there was a fetus with congenital heart disease, the brain size was actually smaller when measured in, in, in MLs. And this is something, I'll show you this in a second again. Is, and, and then what they've also shown in the last 10 years, this is data that's, that's arising from both in Europe and, and in the United States, is that these young patients when, with congenital heart disease, now we're into the neonatal brain, so now they're born, they can have white matter changes. These white, the, almost 40% of them can have white matter changes. This is more common, obviously, in immature or premature babies, but this is a marker, and I'll show you why this is important. And I apologize, this is a busy slide, and I, and I don't want to get into, the, into the, what this slide, the, the sort of the colors of this slide. What I'm trying to show here, this is from Ashok Panagrahi, who's, who's taking the lead at the University of Pittsburgh, and he came out with this five years ago. And basically what he showed was that in transposition brains, in, in children with transposition, there was clearly white matter problems. And that white matter problem, he did neurocognitive testing on this cohort, and he showed that the global efficiency, their, their effect, their executive function was, wor was worse, but he linked it to white matter problems. So what does this mean? What this means is that there is a problem with the brain, the size of the brain. This is data from, from, from uh, Australia and New Zealand. And what this showed uh, was Fontan patients. Let me just go back here for a second. Just to show you 107 Fontan patients. They looked at brain MRIs along with the neurocognitive functioning. And this was fascinating because when you look across, this is in Fontans. The red is the Fontan in, and the blue is transposition and the healthy controls are in the green. Across each metric of the neurocognition, the Fontans did worse, compared even to the transposition patients and then to the healthy volunteers. So clearly, Fontans are seem to be at a higher risk. And what they also showed in Fontan brains was when you look at this, the blue is the Fontan, the healthy control is the red. At every marker, this is volume, this is total brain volume, and then they, they broke this down into white matter and cortex and cerebellar volumes. At each spectrum, the blue is worse, which means the Fontan brain size is smaller, but not just that, even the white matter or the cerebellar volume is lower. So there's clearly a problem. So we go back to our patient. Again, 23 year old, one open heart procedure, says, I can't do this, I'm having trouble in school, I wanna drop out. So what does this mean? So does this mean, is this a continuum? Is this a continuum? Does this start in the fetus that goes into the child, into the young adult? And now we're getting in the world of adult congenital heart disease where the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70 year old patients are out there. So are they changing neurocognitive needs or domains? And let me just spend one or two slides here showing this. This is data from New Zealand. This is non-congenital data. I thought this was fascinating because they looked at a multidisciplinary health cohort and they took patients back in the retrospective, they went back and looked in the 70s all the way to 2000. They followed the same cohort for 35, 40 years. And they, what they showed was that neurocognitive functioning, these are non-congenital patients, changed with time. So the childhood risk factors were different. In adolescence, the same cohort had different risk factors and in adulthood, they had different risk factors. So this is a lifelong domain. This is something that we in adult congenital heart disease or even in, in, in cardiology in general haven't really paid that much attention to. What they also showed was that if you improved inhibitory control as children, so when you intervene as a child, the chances are that in adulthood, they will be better. 
the, the executive functioning will be better. So their quality of life will get better. And this is just to show you that they identified in this non-congenital cohort that there are malleable risk factors, which means stress or anxiety or sleep deprivation. You improve these, this leads to a better quality of life. It's a non-congenital cohort, but the point being that this could be malleable. So let me end here just by showing you quality of life dimensions and why is this important? Because when you talk about quality of life in all our patients, not just congenital heart disease, we talk about physical, social, economic, psychological, and I think cognition is something that we haven't paid that much attention to. And this is something that we need to pay a little more attention to. This is again from uh, Medical College of Wisconsin and they did some great work showing that if you have adults with neurocognitive deficits, they have worse quality of life. They have lower educational attainment, unemployment, their relationships don't go well, they go into depression. So clearly this is something to think about. I'm gonna spend the next two minutes just talking about the future. And this is something that I'm quite excited about. Uh, this is this is an NHLBI funded to the Pediatric Heart Network study that we are doing now. We're leading this at Sinai. This is a multi-institute neurocognitive discovery study. It's called Minds in ACHD. Um, it's being led by myself and Scott Cohen at Wisconsin at the Boston Children's Hospital, Michelle Gervitz. And we are looking at this is, an, uh, as I said, funded through the Pediatric Heart Network and the NHLBI. But the point I'm trying to make here is these are 13 sites that we'll have more than 500 patients. And the data that I just showed you in adult control heart disease, that all the studies have been 30, 40, 50, 60. So we are trying to get to five, 600 patients. We're gonna break it down primarily into complexity. And we're really going to be look, looking into moderate and severe. We're gonna take out mild complex lesions. We're gonna look into neurocognitive testing. Um, this is the battery of tests. Again, one get granular. We have a neuropsychology core with three neuropsychologists that are nationally known that are the bank, the, the, um, the, main, um, uh, the, main, the main campus is going to be the Medical College of Wisconsin. And what we're going, going to do is actually, we were looking for blood samples and we're going to do a genetic analysis. That's going to be a little bit harder with COVID, but, um, but the neurodevelopmental core at Medical College of Wisconsin, we will be looking at, um, um, at saliva samples too. We were launching this um, and we've started now collecting some data. This is a three-year uh, funded project. But with that, what we're also doing is neuroimaging because as I just showed you, there is data that the size of the brain matters in congenital heart disease. So that's the heart-brain connection we're seeing that. So we're now doing an ancillary study with neuroimaging with the University of Pittsburgh, along with Boston Children's that is again coming through with some NIH funding, which, which, which will again take us about three to five years. So the point being, as I end this, that children's and, children and adults with congenital heart disease have neurocognitive deficits. We as in the world of cardiology haven't sort of paid too much attention to this. There are risk factors, as I said, from the fetus all the way to adulthood. But this is a domain that we need help with, with when it comes to neurocognitive dysfunction because we as cardiologists are really not equipped. We need to work with our neuropsychology colleagues and I'm a firm believer that this is this concept of executive functioning that you and I are going through as we speak right now, this higher level of processing is malleable. That if we can intervene, then if we can intervene, then we can actually make changes. And I'm, I'm reasonably sure that if we get good data, then neurocognitive functioning will play a role in adult congenital heart disease. And I actually think that this may be a guideline change if we actually end up with good data. So let me stop here um, and leave the next five minutes for questions. So Steve, I'm gonna, and Dr. Goldman, I'm gonna hand this back to you. So thank you very much. Dr. Zaidi, that was a fascinating talk about something that we don't usually think of. So the question is where, in that time domain from fetal to adult, do you see areas that we can intervene on which can have an impact in improving that executive cognitive function? A great question, Dr. Oman. As, um, as I said, I mean, it's, it, it's, something that, it, it's something that we need to look at as in, in childhood um, and then all the way to adulthood. And as I said, there's three, I think, and this is just me looking at it from the outside, there are three areas. One is the brain, the childhood brain, and what can we do to optimize the risk factors there? I didn't get into granularity, and what that means is that open heart procedures, quick 
quick ICU stays, can we make that valuable? Um, drop sinuses down. There is some data that the length of sinuses um, plays a role. So certainly those things intervene on. And then in the adult cardiology world, what you're seeing is that these patients can sometimes have long-standing advanced heart failure. They can uh, they can have arrhythmias, and so we could be earlier on those. I think that will help. So at each realm, there's going to be some sort of um, intervention. Um, I, I would love to get um, I, I, Dr. Fisher's on the call. I mean, it, it, this is something that on a national level, neurocognitive is now sort of raising its head um, across, across the country. Ali, how do you control for the nurturing aspect of the differences from, you know, parental input on all these patients? Dr. Messi, I couldn't hear the whole question. And how do you control for the nurturing aspect differences? The impact of the parents and, and yeah. how do you, how do you control for that? <laughs> That's a fantastic, fantastic point, Dr. Mancini. So um, there is data in the pediatric cardiology world that there is when we identify neurocognitive dysfunction in a child, there's actually a a, a, a battery of tests that we we actually go to the parents with also. Um, and we actually screen them and then we have to bring them into the equation. So you're right, um, this is not an isolated uh, patient issue. I mean, this is, becomes a more global sort of a family-based issue. So that's a great question. Unfortunately, it's not. No, a, it's, it's the basic question of nature versus nurture, right? Yeah, no, it's very hard. It's, I wish I could give you a sophisticated answer to that. It's, I think it's, it's more, it's, it's difficult, I think. Ali, I have two comments about two projects that we have that are very linked uh -huh. to the wonderful uh, project that you have in your presentation. The first project is, uh, you know, we are dealing with uh, 50,000 children around the world. Mm -hmm. And the concept is very clear that whatever impact your environment has mm -hmm. at early age has a huge implications in your behavior as adult. Mm -hmm. That is what we are really working is in trying to address um, the issue of health as a priority in children between age three to six, because we know that this will have impact mm -hmm. when they are adults in terms of better lifestyles. So I think that part of what you presented today has to do with the incredible impact of the environment in these children undergoing surgery, hospitalizations and so forth later in life. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one aspect that we are addressing from a completely different point of view, which is how to promote health. But the other aspect is a physiological one. And we have, as you probably know, a big project, which is heart brain, mm -hmm. in which we are beginning to see, and Rajib is actually involved in the group in Madrid and so forth, that the risk factors that we have, including, you know, decrease in flow in the brain, which mm -hmm. may occur of obviously in congenital heart disease, but also cures in patients who have risk factors for cardiovascular disease. There is intimal hyperplasia mm -hmm. of the arteriolar system of the brain. And this decrease in oxygen mm -hmm. actually transfers into, and we have done this with MRI mm -hmm. in the, the assessment of flow. It has an impact in the metabolism of the brain and eventually in cognitive function. Mm -hmm. We are seeing this in the adults mm -hmm. who are diabetic mm -hmm. with hypercholesterolemia and hypertension. Mm -hmm. So now I go back to congenital heart disease and I'm sure that the decrease in flow within this case is central, is cardiac, is not arterial in the brain, probably has implications in cognitive function as we are finding now, beginning to find in the adult. So I think that is fascinating the fact that we are moving from the heart to the brain. We have two projects. You have another one. But basically, when you look at the mechanisms and that affect both are very, very similar. And I think what we have to do, Ali, is to join forces and perhaps beginning to work on a program projects that really address the issues as you have in congenital heart disease and in disease in the adults, because right. that's what we are really working on. 
No, I, I agree, Dr. Fusker. I, I think you made some very valid points as, as Dr. Mancini was saying too. This, the, the concept is exactly what you said. So it's certainly the heart-brain connection. Um, and then everything that goes around that we, we, we in adult congenital and congenital heart disease really haven't paid attention to. And, and what's fascinating, Dr. Fusker, as you just said, is that the newest data from Australia and New Zealand in congenital heart disease shows that that these brains are not developing the way they should in congenital heart disease patients. They're smaller in size, um, and it's clearly linked to neurocognitive dysfunction. Um, and as you said, I mean, if we can intervene earlier, um, then I wonder if we can we can make a change. It's it's fascinating data. Uh, hello, I, it's my name. This is Sandy. I just wanted to, two quick questions. One. Uh, yeah, I've kind of looked into this on an amateur basis. What what is the pathology of small vessel disease, and two, uh, how have people or have people studied the neuroregulatory function of, of blood flow into different parts of the brain? You know, at different states. Uh, In answer that, Sandy. Yes. First of all, it's not atherosclerotic disease. It's intimal hyperplasia. In fact, is the is the arteriolar system of the brain reacts to hypertension, not by developing atherosclerosis, but is intimal hyperplasia. And the same is now being seen in diabetes and in hypercholesterolemia. And this is actually what affects the flow in the brain. Now the research, this is a flow is addressed by specific uh, MRI imaging technology. Now the question is, and PET can tell you what part of the brain is affected. I think this is moving very rapidly. And actually we already have data on flow and PET in different regions of the brain with the different risk factors. And this is, we already published some work last week in Jack actually, two weeks ago and then more is coming. And again, we are very involved at this moment, but I don't, cannot give you the answer of what we are doing is descriptive, looking at flow in different parts of the brain and so pet, but we cannot give you the answer, a pragmatic answer of what regions are affected and could or what could be done about it. But these are fascinating new areas of research that are very, very exciting. But Valentin, have people looked at it under the microscope, the arterial yes. assessment? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. There is a, a lot of information in the last five years on autopsy data, looking at what I'm talking about. And actually when I mentioned intimal hyperplasia, it has nothing to do with our work, is the work with, with all pathologists that, uh, that really is pointing out that this is critical. And I will tell you more, the cognitive dysfunction that happens in the adult population, uh, senile disease and so forth, I think has a lot to do by the fact that we have avoiding treating risk factors at younger age. And then the disease that now the pathologists are describing, which is intimal hyperplasia, has implications in flow and PET uptake, as we are finding. Dr. Freeman, it's, uh, it's Ali. So to Dr. Fuster's point, uh, I, can, I can take the second part of your question and add to Dr. what Dr. Fuster just said is that there is flow related and there is some data that flow related changes are happening in the brain. And again, just speaking from an ACHD standpoint, uh, and the, one of the, uh, the projects that we're doing here with Pittsburgh and Boston Children's is looking at that is flow related in congenital heart disease, flow related areas to the, to the brain. There is some in the prelim data that there, there are problems in congenital heart disease patients. That's number one. Number two is what Dr. Fuster said also is what we're seeing, and there's not enough data to sort of put this out there, is that these young adult patients with congenital heart disease where there is flow related changes in the brain that we are postulating can actually have early dementia. So early dementia can be a problem in these ACHD patients. So think about the, the, that these patients are still in their 40s, 50s, 60s in essence, right? So, so the, the, what we are hypothesizing is that because of what Dr. Fuster just said, this flow-related changes, could that lead to early dementia in this cohort of patients who are now in their 50s and 60s or 40s? Um, and that is, as you said, a flow related phenomenon. We are seeing this in some of the smaller studies and, and the study that we are working on here um, is looking at that. It's a three or four year study that will take us a while to get results, but we are looking at that. Um, 
Uh, Ali, this is Donna again. Yeah. Um, I don't understand. Um, why would there be preferential decreased flow to the frontal brain? It's, it's, it's not a good question, Dr. Mantini. It's not just to the frontal brain. It's across um, it's ac across the brain, uh, but but the neurocognitive functioning is all linked to the. It's not all linked to the prefrontal cortex, but because so when the data from um, Australia and New Zealand with the Fontans, they, um, actually I didn't get into the granularity of that. They actually broke down the uh, the volumetric analysis of the brain in prefrontal, frontal. Uh, uh, cortex and cerebella, and each one of those areas was was actually smaller in Fontan patients. But the neurocognition was linked to the prefrontal cortex. So it's not in in essence isolated to just the prefrontal. It's the it's it's the global it's it's, it's global low flow or, or, or I shouldn't say low flow, but global um, uh, volume that's smaller. Well, we have other regions too. It's not only prefrontal. Yeah, we're finding this in the temporal region. And one thing that is critical, and you mentioned, absolutely critical, that when we look at cognitive function, there are six different functions mm -hmm. and are not localized in the same areas. Mm -hmm. And I think this is very critical um, because the one that you mentioned, the executive one, certainly mm -hmm. is in the prefrontal area, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. there are others, mm -hmm. uh, power of synthesis, mm -hmm. perception, et cetera, that are actually in areas like the temporal area and even the occipital area. Right. I, I, I don't want to take too much. I'll just end here with one point just, and the reason why I think this is such a fascinating area for research is because I do believe that this can actually change clinical guidelines for us in the future, because interventions for neurocognition can actually come in, which right now is not sort of standard of care or part of guideline treatments that I'm aware of uh, anywhere in the world, quite honestly, that should we intervene earlier in children or young adults because we don't have the data. So I actually think that this research can probably be guideline changing. Um, I think, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I'm sort of excited about it. This is Sandy, can I ask one quick question? Sure. Has anyone looked at uh, the stiffness of the large vessels and how that affects systolic and diastolic flow uh, into the brain? Uh, Seems today you have a clear day, my friend, <laughs> because it is a very, very hot area. Very basically, the concept at the present time of arterial stress yes, yes. becoming a critical risk factor for everything, including dementia and Alzheimer's, is that the lack of possibility that takes place by the rigidity of the artery, which is easily measurable, as you know. Uh, actually leads to a decrease in the transfer of molecules, and this can have significant implications. In fact, one of the, one of the problems that appears to occur, for example, in Alzheimer's, is that the stiffness of the arterial system may prevent, actually, or may retain products in the brain that are not flowing sufficiently because of this problem. And one of the products is the, the, the amyloid type, the tau and so forth. So there's a lot of work going on, but I can tell you a prediction. In the very near future, we will assess the risk factors of people by imaging technology. That is, there is subclinical disease or there is not. But also physiologically, I think the most important test is going to be stiffness. And I, I'm predicting now how we are moving into risk factor profiling, aside of the conventional factors that we all know. It's going to be what you see that is already troublesome. I think, um, I, I don't know if there are other questions, but I'm always around, but I wanted to thank everybody, Dr. Fuster, Dr. Goldman, um, everybody for for allowing me this opportunity to go to show this interesting area i think it's a fascinating area thank you very much all right thank, thank you have, have a good morning everybody